passenger tapped the driver on the shoulder to ask him a question. <clears throat> the driver screamed, lost control of the car, ran up on the curb, almost hit a bus, and he stopped inches from a parked vehicle. For a second, everything was quiet in the cab. Then the driver said, look, man, don't ever do that again. You scared the living daylights out of me. Passenger apologized and said, I didn't realize that a little tap on the shoulder would scare you so much. And the driver replied, sorry, it's not really your fault. Today's my first day as a cab driver. I've been driving a funeral hearse for the last 25 years. You don't get a tap on the shoulder when you're driving a funeral hearse. My dad was a funeral director and he got locked in the hearse one time. There's no me mechanism to get, to open the door of a hearse from the inside in the back. Only the front doors. And he got, he stalled halfway out the garage. The pile ashes were here and he couldn't get the doors open. And you can't get a back door of a hearse open from inside. There's no handles or anything because nobody has to get out from the inside. <laughs> and he was yelling, his, yelling them. And I heard him hollering my name. And I went out there and opened the back door so he could crawl out of the hearse. Psalm 118, 25 to 27 says this, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. And he has made his light shine on us with bows in hand. <laughs> Join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. That was a prophecy with bows in hand. So Matthew 21, here's, when it, here's what happened. As they approached Jerusalem, and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. Is he sending them out to steal somebody's donkey? If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what, the, what was spoken through the prophet, say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for the privilege we have of handling your word and bringing your word to the family in this house today, Lord, and we just pray that you'll guide this word of yours into our hearts and that it will have the effect that you want it to have. In Jesus' name, amen. We don't see Jesus riding on a donkey or on a horse or anything else until this event. It's not recorded in Scripture until this event that he is riding anything. He moved about between Judea and Galilee on foot, weary, toilsome travel of the common people. 
Jesus rides the donkey to fulfill prophecy. Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And another prophecy was in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Down to verse 5, the animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. The directive in, in Exodus was celebrated then every year called the Passover. They still celebrate it today. The Jews from around the world would come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Now, the real Lamb of God, the, you know, that the Lamb of Exodus represented or foreshadowed was coming into Jerusalem on, Palm, on what we celebrate as Palm Sunday. Into the midst of the crowd that was there to celebrate the Passover of their tradition from Exodus. They were to bring a lamb. One for each family. 1,400 to 1,500 years later, the real Lamb of God, the one who would be the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, now arrives in Jerusalem on a donkey. All four evangelists wrote of this entry of Jesus into Jerusalem five days before his death, five days before the cross. Christ, Christ rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. He had ordered two of his disciples to take a donkey. Untie the donkey, he said. Some translations you might see untie the colt. There would be a confrontation. There's always a confrontation when we untie the donkey. There's always a confrontation. The donkey was to be the vehicle which brought Jesus into Jerusalem where he would be crucified five days later. Jesus showed his authority say that the Lord needs it. His word was all that was needed. Because he said so, they allowed the donkey to be taken to Jesus. Jesus bids us to untie the donkey, to loosen the vehicle of the gospel. That donkey was the vehicle that brought Jesus into Jerusalem and five days later he would be the ultimate sacrifice but now we carry the gospel and sometimes we need to untie the donkey to loosen the donkey so that we can just do that the, the donkey had to be freed for its use for Jesus to use it, it had to be set free. Someone had it tethered. It was tied up. It was bound. The tethers prevented the donkey's use. You can't go anywhere on a donkey that's tied up. Sometimes we feel inadequate for the task of carrying the gospel, of carrying Jesus. We're all inadequate for that task. We're all inadequate. But God prepares us. God makes us adequate for whatever he calls us to do. I'm not saying that you're a donkey. 
But what I am saying is you are the vehicle that carries the gospel. Thank you. That's true. So untie your donkey. The Lord needs it. Just like the Lord needed that donkey to carry him down in to where he would be sacrificed on the cross. The Lord needs it. So the Lord needs you. What about the crowds? One crowd knew who he was. Actually, there were two crowds who knew who he was. A large crowd went before him, and a large crowd followed. They were the ones, these crowds were the ones who threw their cloaks on the road in his path. They were the ones who cut branches to put on the road in the path of the donkey and its holy rider. They were the ones who were shouting, Hosanna! Does anybody know what that means? Does anybody know what that means, Hosanna? This is from Kyle Blevins from Crosswalk.com. It means, it, there's a couple meanings, but one is that it means save, please. In other words, please, Lord, save us. Please, Lord, give us success. That's in Psalm 118, 25. In Hebrew, the word hoshiana is translated in Greek as hyosana. In English, we know it as hosanna. The original intent of the scripture is save. It is viewed as a plea for help. It's as if we were yelling, stop, at someone about to throw a firecracker at us. <laughs> we use this when we understand the potential impact of something about to happen. And this is, it's an act of surrender. In moments like this, we realize we cannot save ourselves. And we need to connect to our source of security quickly. In the firecracker example, that security is the person with the firecracker in their hand. In our spiritual lives, though, that security is God. In his purest form, this is worship. As we feel we have come to the end of ourselves and we need God to intervene. Number two, so Hosanna means salvation. Thank you. Throughout different translations and edits, the original plea to please save us changed to a proclamation of salvation. Thank you. In Psalm 118, verse 25, it says, Please, Lord, please save us. Please give us success. That's the only time this plea is used. Right after that, in verse 26, there was a shift from concern to confidence. Have you been there? From concern to confidence. Faith is the hinge. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Verse 26 says, Blessed is the one who comes in the, name, in the name of the Lord. This is a great example of faith and a demonstration of the shift from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Today we hear songs like the ones described in the, in the opening and read scriptures in the New Testament where Hosanna is used more as a term of adoration and praise. The main crowd, those who were in town for the Passover festival, they came from all over. They didn't know who he was. The city did not know him. Even large crowds knew him, but the city did not. He traveled abroad doing his miracles and blessed people, mostly in the countryside, but the people, the city of Jerusalem did not know him. And those would be the people who would shout, crucify him, the people of the city. The crowd that brought him down 
were apart from his disciples. His disciples were there, but these crowds were followers. People who wanted to see Jesus in action. Bethphage was not far from Bethany where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. They knew that he could do miracles. They knew about him. These people were downtrodden people in an occupied country. The Romans were cruel occupiers and cruel taskmasters. Some in the crowds probably thought that Jesus, the miracle worker, would deliver the nation from the Romans. They thought the Messiah would come, kick the Romans out, and set up his earthly kingdom. They knew that he was a prophet, and they knew where he came from. The disciples knew him as Messiah. Not much different from today. His disciples, like us, they knew and accepted him as Lord and Savior, his disciples. But that was only one of the crowds that was there. Some knew about him. That was another crowd. And just like today, they know about him, but they deny his power. They know about him, but they're not going to submit to him. Many call themselves Christian, who actually are not Christian. Many call themselves, they use that word. Matthew 7, 22 and 23 says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Christians then, true Christians are then who know him, who know him as Lord and Savior. Not just heard about him, know about him, but know him personally. 2 Timothy 3, 5, having the form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. There's churches that do that. They talk about Jesus, teach about Jesus, read about Jesus, but deny his power, his miracle-working, life-changing power that we respect today. Jesus would, in a couple of days, go to the garden he would go to a place of prayer. In Luke 22, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Verse 44, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood flowing to the ground. If it is possible, if you're willing, Father, take this cup from me what cup what cup do you think he was trying to avoid I have my theory you've heard me say this before I don't think Jesus was afraid to die he came here to do that he came here specifically to be that sacrifice and he knew that from eternity that's why he came here he knew they would torture him and torment him. I don't think he was trying to get out of that. What was going to happen to him that was so horrible? Second Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of Oh God. My theory is that that was the cup. That he would take our sins, all the sins that were and ever would be on him. And at that moment, the father would turn away from him. He had never been separated from the father. Our sin separated him. Our sin separates us from God. 
So he took our sin on him and it separated him from God for a moment. From noon to three in the afternoon, Matthew 27. Darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew that would happen. And I think that's the cup that he's talking about when he said, could you take this cup if it's your, if you be your will from me? Jesus would have in a few days laid out his life on the cruel cross of Calvary a few days after that entrance and after that time in the garden. At this time, Jews came to Jerusalem from all over the world to celebrate the Passover. They're required to have a perfect lamb, a lamb without blemish. They could either bring one with them or purchase one, but it had to be unblemished. Some of them traveled a long ways. So there were vendors who would sell unblemished, perfect lambs that were suitable for the sacrifice. They would sacrifice the lamb and then consume it in this festival. Part of it was to go to the Levites and the priests, but they all consumed in this festival. God's timing is always perfect. Jesus showed up at the perfect time. He shows up in your life at the perfect time. Showed up in our life in 1973 at the Hartford Gospel Tabernacle. He came to be the ultimate sacrifice that was once for all time when he said, it is finished on the cross. The sacrifice was complete. He gave up his spirit. The debt was paid. My debt, your debt, our sin debt. The penalty was paid. The prophecies were fulfilled and the way for us was provided. The Messiah had come. He had done his work. He had defeated death, hell, and the grave. Next week, Resurrection Sunday, we'll talk more about that. Knowing what he went through, knowing what he did, and knowing that he did it for you personally and me should cause us to be so eternally grateful. But we have to keep it in mind. That's why we come together to worship him, to declare his praises, and to honor him. So the question that we need to take with us today, and maybe the answer, is your colt tied? Do you have some reservation about sharing the gospel? Do you feel free enough to share your faith? Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Do you need to untie the colt? Do you need to be set free? They untied it because Jesus needed it. Jesus needs you. Untie the colt. Amen. Amen. Untie the colt. And sometimes we have to do that, you know, we have to do it fresh sometimes. So, you know, I've been untying the colt since I got saved, but I wasn't a minister until about eight years ago. But I wasn't afraid. But some of us are. They'll think I'm weird, you know. They'll think I'm weird, people I work with or people I'm in school with or people my neighbors, they'll think I'm weird. That's a cult that's tied. <laughs> if you let that stop you, Jesus needs you to share the gospel. And you need to untie the cult. Amen. Would you stand? God is so good. I think we can all say that life is hard. 
we, I mean, the vintage most of us are, could say that we've seen hardship. We've seen hard times. We've had friends and family that's had hard times. This little baby, we don't know what happened to this little baby. We don't know what's going to happen. Trust in God. So life is hard. We admit that. But God is good. You can't out hard the goodness of God. Amen. Father, I thank you for my family here today. It's so precious to me to be the pastor here, to be able to say this is my church and these are my fellow believers. It's so precious to me, Lord. So I ask you to help us all to untie our colt and to have the freedom, Lord, to carry the gospel just as they untied the donkey years ago and so that we'd be free to carry you to the sacrifice. We don't have to sacrifice, Lord. You did it. All we have to do is carry the gospel, carry the good news. All we have to do is be the messengers. Help us, Lord, to feel free to do that. Help us to untie the donkey so that we can carry the gospel. Bless your people as we go forward. Thank you, Jesus, for this Palm Sunday. And bless us when we meet on Easter Sunday. In Jesus' name, amen. Come and get a palm.